Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Where is Jesus? How does the Christian live in the intervenient time, the time between the ascension of our Lord and the last day, the day of judgment? We might follow after our doubts and think that he has forgotten us, forgotten the people of his promise. Perhaps having set the church in motion, Jesus ascended and then left us to fend here on earth for ourselves. That's what the disciples thought after our Lord's resurrection. They hid away in the upper room or they hid in their work, not quite sure if Jesus was the man they thought he was, the man of his word. They grew impatient. Their prayers faltered. Their mercy towards one another even ended. They drew into their shells for fear and with doubt. And perhaps that's where you are today as well. But hear this word from Jesus. I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus promised that he would not leave those disciples or you alone, but that he would come to you, that he would come and your heart would rejoice. But the disciples were in for a difficult patch, rough sailing, indeed death at the hands, who would think that they, by killing the disciples, were worshiping the true God. And notice in particular those who would cause these disciples the most grief. Jesus said, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. Those who will make the disciples' life most miserable, even kill them, will be fellow believers, people who think that they are serving God. According to Jesus, then, who challenges faithful Christians to abandon the faith the most? Who is it that heaps scorn and ridicule on those who believe Jesus? He had said repeatedly that the world, the devil, and all the demonic host will seek out your hurt and harm. But Jesus today wants you to also know that there will be challenges to the true faith from even within the church. And actually, even in the church, it's going to be even more hostile, more difficult than the world. Not only from outsiders, but also from insiders will be those who seek to shipwreck your faith. Family, friends, even those who call themselves Christians will seek out your hurt and your harm. Today, Jesus says that his disciples will suffer and often will be martyred for the truth. And they'll be martyred by those who are the upstanding religious types. They'll be martyred for the truth. Now you remember that Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Now today's popular thinking, of course, is that there is no such thing as true, or rather, that whatever is true for you doesn't need to be true for me. Truth is whatever you believe in your heart. Most consider it actually ignorant to suppose that any one person or group has a corner on what is true and right and real. So it's one thing to dispute with a family member or a friend about trivial things, preferences, politics, but it's another thing to suggest that there is only one true faith, one faith true Lord and Savior, one baptism, one forgiveness of sins. 
That's probably why you're taught from a young age to avoid talking about religion and also politics and one other topic <laughs> among family or friends. The prophecy of Jesus, though, and the experience as it's recorded in the Acts of the Apostles reveal that it's true. Even those who call themselves Christians will oppose you, you who believe truthfully, rightfully, faithfully, orthodox. That's because sometimes we like to just use the label Christian as an excuse to avoid confronting error false teaching, or immoral behavior. We're all Christians, right? Shouldn't we just turn a blind eye to our differences? Can't we just agree to get along? We all have one Jesus after all. We don't have to agree on everything that he said. But Jesus himself (laughs) disagrees. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but by me. And the apostles also agree. They say, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. And also, we command you, brothers, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he has received from us. Now that's not a popular teaching at all, is it? To tell the erring brother, the false believing or false practicing brother or sister in Christ here in the congregation to leave. But actually what we're saying is, repent. Hmm. Of course, there's a long history in the church of times where error was actually confronted and refuted and the truth preserved. We actually recall this every time we gather. We confess one of the ancient ecumenical creeds. Today, the Apostles' Creed which was given in the Church of Rome to correct errors regards to the faith of the baptized. On Sundays where the sacrament is celebrated, we confess the Nicene Creed, the creed which rejected the Arian apostasy of the third and fourth century. And Christians, Christians actually died because of the truth. They died preserving the truth for your sake, that you would hear and believe what Jesus has said. And that's because those even who called themselves Christians but who refused to hear and to listen to Jesus himself actually have not known the Father nor Jesus. The apostles themselves, the 11 that heard this word on that night, they were all, with one exception, Tradition says, martyred for the truth. They died to confess Jesus. And in the two millennia that have followed since, Christians still die daily to defend the truth. They die to confess the apostolic faith. And what is this apostolic faith? How can you claim to know the truth? How can you possibly know with any degree of certainty that what you believe is the God's honest truth. Well, Jesus today tells you. He said, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. When Jesus promised you that you would not face this time of the church alone, he promised In that same breath, the paraclete, that is, the helper, the comforter, the advocate. He helps, he comforts, he advocates for you by bringing you to Jesus. He is sent from the Father to bring you to Jesus by the word. And how then has Jesus fulfilled his promise to not leave you as orphans? 
He's done so by His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who comes bearing His Word into your ears so that Jesus is always with you through His Word. When you hear Jesus speaking, you're hearing it, hearing Him by the Spirit. And most importantly, when you believe the Word of Jesus, when you believe that His Word is truth, that's the Spirit doing the Spirit's business. Notice again the title that Jesus himself gives the Spirit. He's called the Spirit of Truth. Not of one truth or many truths, but of truth, the truth, the Spirit of Jesus. So by the work of the Spirit, this is what you know. You know for certain that Jesus Christ is your Savior. You know that his blood atoned for your sins. You know that his death destroyed your death. And you know that his resurrection is proof positive of your own bodily resurrection on the last day. You know this is the truth because you've received the spirit of truth through his word and by your baptism. You first received the spirit in your baptism when faith was given to you through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul told Titus. You keep receiving the Spirit when your sins are declared forgiven for Jesus' sake. The Spirit preserves you in the true faith through the proclamation of Jesus' word. And the Spirit, the Spirit that proceeds from the Father, who is sent by the Son, joins Jesus' own word to the bread and wine to give you his very body and blood. This Sunday, after our Lord's ascension, which we celebrated on Thursday, the Sunday between the ascension and before Pentecost, used to be called Waiting Sunday. Waiting Sunday. Because the time that we are in now in the church is a time of waiting between our Lord's ascension and his coming again on the last day in judgment. The work of salvation is accomplished and the fruit of his saving continues in our lives. It's Christ's work and he is here amongst us doing it. He's not absent, he's present through his word and his gifts to accomplish exactly what he promised the disciples on that night. And at the same time, we wait We wait for its fullness, its completion, having see him ascend and now watching for him to come again in the same way that he ascended. We look for the ascended Lord to come upon the clouds to judge the living and the dead. And so we wait. And while we wait, we cry out, exaudi, that is, hear us, O Lord. Hear us as we pray. Hear us as we struggle against our sin. Hear us as the world seeks our hurt and harm. Hear us as we are assaulted by enemies outside and within. Hear us as our possessions and income fail. Hear us as we doubt your preserving hand in the midst of a pandemic. Hear us as we doubt your coming again. Hear us now as we grow impatient. Hear us, O Lord, and hide not your face from me. We cry out. And if we didn't have our Lord's word of promise, I will not leave you as orphans. I will send my spirit upon you. That waiting would not be possible. Our lives would be marked by impatience and doubt. Because apart from Christ, there is no cry of Christian prayer. There's only the cry of despair and panic. Apart from Christ, there is no living, but only hastily bull-rushing towards our death. But in Christ, you wait with hope. With Christ, you pray without ceasing, knowing that the Father hears your prayers. In Christ, you daily die to sin and rise to new life in him, forgiven. You live knowing that the end of all things is at hand, And having received the Spirit, you also then bear witness. Your lives are witness to the overflowing grace of your Lord. You speak 
You live, you receive the truth here and in your families and in your communities. You pray and love one another earnestly. You cover each other's sins. You're hospitable. You speak to one another the truth, the word, and you hear the word with glad hearts. This is all the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has not left you orphans. He's at work in your life even now because it's the Spirit that gave force to the witness of the apostles. It's the Spirit who bears fruit in you to be faithful, charitable, hospitable, to be faithful like them even unto death. Most of all, the Spirit gives you the word to say when truth must be spoken. It's the Spirit who is the great defender of the truth. He is the Spirit of truth, after all. And so he continually is raising up in our midst faithful Christians to defend the truth through word and deed before pagan, unbeliever, and hypocrite. By the Holy Spirit, you've received Jesus. By him, the church is glorified through Jesus Christ. By the Spirit, the elect are gathered from the four corners of the world from every people and place and age to be with Jesus forever. And for all this, thanks be to Jesus. In his holy name, amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.